that good? Great. Well, listen, let's get started. Thank you, thank you very much for joining this session. Um, this, as you can see, this is, uh, we're gonna be talking about the uh, frontiers of displacement, migration, uh, you know, being one of the big themes um, at this conference. Um, and specifically, today we're gonna talk about the role of women, um, women, you know, in migration flows, um, and also how uh, technology, the presence of technology and the spread of technology um, is helping to address um, a number of important issues that arise um, as the overall uh, situation with respect to migrants and refugees grows in a number of places around the world. Um, I'm Liz Alderman, I'm a journalist with the New York Times, um, and I'm based here in Europe, and this panel is um, of particular interest to me because I spent a significant amount of time covering uh, the refugee crisis um, as it broke open here in Europe. Um, I spent a lot of time uh, reporting, for example, uh, in the refugee camps in Greece, where there are still over 50,000 people stuck with no way to move forward or back. Um, I've also followed uh, a number of refugees and asylum seekers um, as they made their way from Greece and were lucky enough, for example, to try to settle down in places like Germany and the Netherlands, here in France. Um, but of course, the refugee crisis is by no means limited to Europe at all. Um, there are uh, significant uh, displacement uh, crises that uh, have been around for a very long time that continue to evolve um, in Africa and in the Middle East. And so we've got a couple of panelists today who are um, really in the midst of helping to deal with the situation in a variety of ways. Um, so I'm very pleased to welcome, first of all, uh, Charlotte Lindsay Crete, who is the Director of Communications and Information at the International Committee of the Red Cross. Um, and uh, we also have Josephine Gu, who's the CEO of TechFugees, which is a, an NGO that has been coordinating the international tech industry's response to the needs of refugees. Uh, we'd also been hoping to welcome uh, Salve Hieronymus, who's um, at McKinsey and Company uh, today. She has done a significant amount of work with McKinsey on refugees and migration. Unfortunately, she caught a terrible flu bug um, and was not able to be with us today, but that leaves us more time to, to talk about the issues that are important. And Charlotte, I mean, I would love to sort of open up with you um, and just have you, have you uh, talk to us a little bit about, um, from your bird's eye view at the ICRC, what, is, what, is the, uh, what are the main challenges that you have been seeing um, in these regions that I just mentioned? Um, what are the specific challenges facing women that you've seen? And also, um, what, what technological tools are you all using to help mitigate some of these uh, crisis situations? Thank you. Can everybody hear? Because all we can hear is noise around. <laughs> okay, so I work for the International Committee of the Red Cross. Some of you may have seen my colleague Marianne on the stage just earlier. Um, she was talking about Syria, and maybe just to start with a few statistics. So but you, six out of 10 Syrians are displaced. And displacement means not necessarily crossing an international border. So you're a refugee if you cross an international border. You can be internally displaced where you stay within your own country. So six out of 10 Syrians are displaced. And that's the highest number. It's unprecedented for any one country in recent history. Um, just, it's not a problem linked only to the Middle East. So if I just give you some numbers, 1.6 million South Sudanese are, are displaced, 2.4 million Nigerians, 4.7 million Iraqis, um, they're all displaced. So it's not any one region, and it's not uh, something which necessarily ends in a refugee flow, because the vast majority of people, more than two thirds of those who are displaced, forcibly displaced by conflict, stay, in their own country and they can be displaced multiple times and so I think it's important to put it into context that it's very very few people that actually end up on what is being labeled the migratory flow today so the vast majority remain within their country many remain on their borders so on they have become a refugee but they're on the bordering countries and then there are some that end up on the migratory flow um, what I just wanted to say also is that it's important to understand how long displacement goes on. We think about emergencies, and if you look, the average time of displacement linked to armed conflict is 23 years. So that's the average time you will have been displaced. And the average time to be away from your country for a refugee is 17 years. So these are not necessarily emergency, um, short-term issues. They are think, 
displacement has enormous consequences. And I think there I've given you a number of numbers, but I actually wanted to say this is fundamentally not about numbers. It's about people. It's about the ways that they are affected and the multiple ways that they're affected. If you've been, if you're displaced, if you are uh, in, displaced in your country or abroad, you have a major disruption to your education. We heard the speaker before from UNICEF, or from your uh, from access to lives and livelihoods, to separation from family members, um, access to water, food, shelter, and security. So all of those things affect you as an individual when you are displaced. And I think that is something that we have seen growing with the vast numbers of people that are affected today. Um, what I think it's also important to understand is where can technology play a role and how are women affected? Um, I think critically, we, un we hear a lot about women being the majority of those who are displaced or those who are fleeing with their children. Yes, it's true, a lot of women uh, are fleeing, but they also flee because their menfolk have been severely impacted. So men are the ma vast majority of those who are detained. They're the vast majority of those who, who disappear in relation to armed conflict forcible disappearances or, or go missing. Uh, they're the vast majority of those who are targeted. So women may be forced to flee because of what is happening to their menfolk and because it may be easier or they may be allowed to leave the context because they are women. Uh, so you cannot look at the impact of conflict and displacement on women in isolation from the reasons why it's happening to them and the impact on, on men. If I look at now some of the ways that, that really technology can help, let me go back to the Middle East. So we think there are at least one million people missing in relation to armed conflicts in the Middle East. What we're now trying to look at is say, the situation of people who are missing in relation to armed conflict creates immense problems of suffering for those family who don't know their fate, but it also creates major problems, particularly also for women, as many of those missing are men, in terms of their ability to access uh, support networks because they cannot verify the fate of their missing, or the titles to their homes, or really to be recognized as a female, he female head of household, whether in displacement or not. So one of the things we're trying to do is really limit the number of, of years uh, that there is a lack of knowledge about missing people or lack of knowledge about the fate of missing people and to identify how we can use technology today to reduce that uh, lack of knowledge. And what we have identified is big data analytics, so aggregating mass data sets as well as facial recognition technology could be a way forward to try to link that to some of the work we do on the ground in relation to forensics, dead body management, in relation to tracing people. So there's a number of ways that technology that we've been using already for decades but can be linked now with new technology to try to, to look at ways we can, we can really reduce the length of time of people uh, not lack of knowledge about the fate of their missing. And that's really important in terms of reconciliation and also in terms of having the, uh, the, the sense of security that you can go home or move on with your life or grieve or, and all the other consequences that come with that. So that's just one example of the way, of the way technology can help and, and the way that we have been developing this facial recognition technology, big data analytics, with a, with a way to resolve through technology it's one of the biggest humanitarian problems that we see linked to armed conflict. And Josephine, you know, on the ground, you know, here in Europe, your organization has, doing, has been doing a significant amount of work in terms of trying to help refugees who have made it over here get integrated and with, with, with a particular focus on, on young women and also uh, women who have come over, uh, you know, with their families but wind up playing a much more traditional role in the household having to stay at home um, as the husband goes out and, and tries to find work and, and they're left behind. Talk to us a little bit about you know what you've seen, um, what your goals are, and, and what you've been doing. Yeah, thank you. Um, so just to give you a bit of context of uh, TechFugees, uh, TechFugees is a very young organization. Uh, we're only two years old. Um, we were started in London in 2015 as, a, as an inflow of people came to Europe as, and as emotion uh, came out in the media towards that flow uh, of Europeans. Uh, the, the emotion was from Europeans. Like, what can we do? And I think a lot of people around here, um, here today, but also in Europe uh, and elsewhere, have had this feeling of powerlessness. What can we do to help? 
because they're coming and we don't know where they are and we don't know what to do. Um, so we harnessed this um, in London. We created a hackathon and conference where we talked about what technology can do and what can we do as citizens using our mobile phones every day to use those people coming, because to help these people coming. Because probably you've seen it and it has shocked a lot of people, the migrants, refugees, whatever you want to call them, <laughs> the people, human beings coming to Europe looking for shelter were using smartphones. They were using mobile phones and it shocked a lot of people. Well, yeah, um, they do. They do and it's, as you said, uh, one piece of technology that is really useful to collect data and one really useful piece of technology to find back your, um, your loved ones. We know that thanks to this, thanks to this smartphone, a lot of them can keep in touch, can on WhatsApp tell that they're sinking at the border to the Coast Guards, that they can tell that uh, their parents went this way and they're trying to reach them. So a lot of um, reconnecting people together in families has happened through those WhatsApp, Facebook and, and, and phones basically. So we were built on the basis of we're going to create a community of people in Europe that want to use those technologies to communicate with the refugees and build together a community of solutions. So we started in London, I said, and then the day after New York, uh, Paris, Varso called and young millennials from all these capital cities said, we want to engage our tech skills into building apps, platforms, chatbots, AIs for the cause. So obviously I'm not going to lie, uh, it came from a very good intentions and sometimes very naive of what is possible to do and there was a lot of failures, a lot of people creating apps on iPhones in English and um, <laughs> here is another failure, um, um, creating apps on iPhones and yeah, not everyone has an iPhone and not everyone speaks English. So let's get back to the reality of like, who are those people fleeing? What can, what, uh, what's their use of technology? And which language do they speak? And there was a lot of learning from our community of being with the refugees to build those technologies. Being in uh, places in, in, fr in France, in the UK, in incubators, in accelerators, and having design workshops to be with the refugees building those technologies. I'll give you uh, one example of what we've built in Europe. Uh, it was in Norway. We realized that a lot of women, a lot of refugee families came to Norway because they had the idea that Norway was a safe country for their families and they could be well taken care of, especially if they had young babies. Um, and one thing is they didn't know about their rights to access healthcare. So what we developed is a new way of getting information. It's a chatbot. And a chatbot is a conversational way of having information. It's also personalized because you ask the robot a few questions and you get back the information you want. It's in your language. And it was also geolocalized. So what was the experience? Well, a woman who is Iranian who speaks Farsi could converse with a robot in Farsi saying, my, my belly um, hurts. Um, I am five months pregnant and I'm worried that something is happening. The robot was not giving medical advice, don't be scared. It was giving her, okay, on a scale to one to five, how painful is it? Okay, five out of five, right. You probably are right, so let's contact someone who speaks Farsi that lives 500 meters away and can help you go to a doctor or we can contact directly a doctor. So it was a new approach to information. And, and frankly, that's one example out of many others we've seen in Germany, in Sweden, in France, built with refugees. And it's about how do we create a community of people that are trying to create solutions. Because frankly, and I think you said it really right, is um, this is not new. Um, I, I come from Calais. Um, I've seen always migrants. There was nothing new. There's more people that came in 2015 and yet, we had those flows in the 90s when Yugoslavia was going down, right? So it was not new. There was a lot of coverage out of it and it became like this uh, big uh, big branding of like Kelly the jungle and stuff. Well, um, Red Cross can talk much better about this about because you've been longer on the ground, but it's been years and years and years that we had refugees and you gave the number 17 years you, before you returned to your country, 23 years as a refugee. 
So what I'm amazed by is how we are surprised today that this problem uh, sounds new, it's not new. So our community with Tech Refugees is about how do we create the future? Because the future is like this. The future is we're gonna have more refugees, climate change, uh, conflicts, and all the people that have not been taken care of, the Palestinians, three generations. The Colombians, you know, we're having the peace process now and you have the FARCs, the displaced people from villages to towns, they have to go back. So how are we going to deal with all these people who have not taken care for years and years and years and years using technology? Why? Technology doesn't fix a political crisis. It helps as a mean to put people in touch together <laughs> when it works. Um, and, and it's at scale. It's at scale, it can be 12 languages, 13 languages, and so it can be a really powerful meme to get people together and, and look for the future. Uh, and I'll stop here. Yeah, let me, that's great. Let me just jump in here and on, you know, on that note, maybe ask the two of you to talk a little bit about, as you said, I mean, this, it's not new and it's not going to be stopping anytime soon. In, in fact, displacement is going to um, be uh, an, 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 ever, an ever growing challenge, obviously politically, but also, you know, on a human scale. And I wanted to go back to something, Charlotte, that you had, had mentioned earlier. Um, one of, one of the um, uh, technologies that your organization and other organizations have been using as displacement grows to try and, for example, help family members uh, keep track of one another, um, help keep track also of, of people, of the, of the general displacements that are going on. Things like facial recognition technology, that can certainly help. But aren't there also, what are the risks um, of some of these new technologies for the refugees who would be using them themselves. Yeah, I think that you know, there's a lot of focus on the opportunities that technology brings. I think one of the things that we've had to look at working in highly insecure environments is what are the risks. Um, there are risks which come basically because there are increasing demands by authorities themselves around sovereignty of data and information on their own individuals, which they don't want to be able to move across borders. But there is also risks to the individuals themselves who maybe have always, have given up a certain amount of privacy because it was convenient to them, because they could connect to different platforms to help them. But then those, app, those convenient things become actually a major risk factor for them. And there can be repression based on their digital presence. So who you follow, who you, fo who you are followed by, can be a very risk of insecurity. So we've had to start looking over the last years at something we label information as aid. So people traditionally think of food, water, shelter, medical, but actually information itself, which is highly sensitive in insecure environments, but to say, well, let's look at what are the channels that you're using, so humanitarian messaging apps or messaging apps. And we have done surveys in countries like Yemen, uh, asking people where they get their sources of information from and what do they use channels for. Because if you talk about very serious protection problems that you have, threats to your life or that of your family on an insecure channel, this could actually pose a bigger problem for you. And so we have to help people navigate the real complexities of the, the benefits of technology, but also the risks of technology to themselves, because that can also be a factor then for their further displacement or, or, or insecurity. So there are many, many opportunities. What we have had to look at is data protection. So if I look at my own organization, seven years ago, we didn't have one data protection lawyer. We have seven full-time data protection lawyers now, because you have to be able to demonstrate either to the national authorities or to the beneficiaries themselves that you are treating, handling their data correctly and that you are not posing a risk. So we have to do impact assessments of all of the technology we use to assess where, what the risks are. Because now, for example, cash transfers are really seen as a good way forward to be able to maximize the ability to deliver more assistance directly to people. However, if you have to give over information about yourself, biometric information, data on you, and a financial intermediary is exactly those authorities or a group that could be a threat for you, this can pose a massive problem. So to be able to really maintain trust 
which is absolutely critical for us in insecure environments. You also have to make sure the technology you use does not pose a threat for those. And I think, you know, tech for refugees work in countries which are secure and where refugees have either a status or they are trying to get status. It's very different than working in countries where people are either still in their home country and risk and risk further uh, repression or, or, or insecurity from parties to conflict. I, I totally relate to that. Um, a lot of the projects we're built in Europe from our community were without uh, an understanding of how sensible data was. They all come from startups and tech world where you take the data and you sell it to marketers. And so we saw that at our hackathons, our, an event where technologies build technology, they would come up and be like, oh yeah, the business model will sell the data and, and it will be over. We're like, whoa, 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 whoa. No, you don't sell the data. There are people that are threatening, that their life was threatened by, by their country and if it in the wrong hands, smugglers would love that data of their phone numbers to just like call them and say, hey, do you want to go to the other side? So um, totally, it, it, uh, this is what we do. And, a lot of people ask us, but what do you do? We like we educate them to just do a business model that is safe and secure and sound. And uh, we had we tried. So now we're putting a we're in Syria. Um, we are in uh, the suburb of Aleppo with some volunteers and a charity called um, Syria Relief, putting MOOCs uh, for those young women who are between 13 to 22 and want to continue studying instead of going to early marriages or going into the uh, working informally so that they can go back to education and then they can get a degree that is recognized online. And so if one day the war is over, they will still be able to say like, look, I took this course for four years or two years and I really know what it is and it, it can be validated by Sciences Po or uh, could be validated by uh, Harvard uh, and they have not lost their time, right? Uh, but Doing that project, the 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 the, the number of, uh, um, of I would say piège, of traps we could get involved of like giving the yeah those devices having them tracked and making sure that nobody can know where they are studying those young girls and stuff was like a, such a hurdle. So to add to your point is the technology is there in terms of technicalities we could help them. But is how secure is that technology? Who's financing it? Because uh, it's not about marketers who are going to finance it. Um, and it's about, yeah, at, at the end of the day, politics also. Who really want to help those refugees? Yeah. Um, I want to be able to leave enough time to take questions from you all. So uh, think of some questions um, that, that uh, I want to ask. I want to ask one before I turn it over to you guys. Um, but I just wanted to pick up on, on something that, that you said, you know, the, your, your program uh, in Syria, you know, near Aleppo, um, where you had a lot of young women, you know, coming to study, eager. Basically, I mean, that was, you know, once, of course, once they got over here to Europe too, um, people, one of, their, one of the main concerns of, of many asylum seekers is, I'm losing time. I had to leave my uh, university. Um, you know, uh, how am I going to get a diploma? I'm I'm young. I'm eager. I want to um, be a part. You know, of of basically the European uh, you know workforce, as it were. They all had their pitch ready. Um, but you know, one one thing that I noticed was, for example, as I was mentioning to you. Um, even people who had been stuck in some of the Greek refugee camps for well over a year, I met people who wound up speaking amazing English because they had downloaded an app on their phone and just basically sat around and studied while they they were in their tent, you know, the whole time. And so this issue of you know education, I mean, how how is how are the what, how does tech how can technology sort of help with that? The programs that you're talking about, but you know, Charlotte. You know, what, what also have you all been uh, doing to, to try and, and push that agenda? Uh, um, yes, I mean, the number of young refugees that have come to our hackathons in Europe and speak perfect French or perf perfect English because they learned it through an app uh, is just uh, crazy. Uh, Noor the other day who came to our hackathon and won the hackathon said, you know, with my phone I can order a taxi, I can order food with Deliveroo, but I can never order uh, a class of French. Why? Well, I'll build that because uh, nobody's doing it. So now he's building an app for any refugee in France to access locally French courses because there's nothing there. 
um, and he learned in French in six months. And the funny story, as the way he pitched it all the time, is the first word I learned in French was "oh la la," because every time people were asking me where are you from, he was like Syria, and they're like "oh la la, oh la la," <laughs> and so he does this all the time. So it's funny. He really picked up on French like so crazily. So yes, um, and in terms of education. There are numerous people, innovators across Europe, that are doing this. So we had um, Chiron University, if you've heard of. They're providing a platform for refugees to be educated and then go back into education in formal uh, degrees that are passed on. Uh, Karen is the biggest one. Then you have all these open online uh, courses that are trying to be uh, open to refugees for no fees. Um, and I mean, there's several ways People are just trying to actively get into that, and it's it's the number of projects. It's just the problem is that there's too many, and they're not getting together. You know. I think that I mean everybody will talk about education and how important it is. We all know how important it is in our own families to for our children to access schools, and I think even well those of us who've grown up in secure environments take it for granted. But certainly what I saw when I was uh, working in the field with the ICSC and studying the impact of armed conflict on women, education is one of those that they put up high on the hierarchy of needs because it's not just about educating their children, it's about the future of the family too as they move forward. And it's one of the major reasons for displacement too because people flee because how many generations do you wait until without education? So one, I used to be able to say ICRC, the International Committee of the Red Cross does mo everything in armed conflict except for education. And in recent years, we've had to start <laughs> changing that because we were being pushed to by donors, by beneficiaries, by others to say, you have to look at education now because we believe ICSC is one of the only international organizations present on the ground could, has to step in and help. So we're looking at really the education in danger because when, how do we help? Because schools are militarized, um, because schools teachers are, are forced to um, flee. And so we've had to start looking at how do we respond to the needs of people around education and negotiating with all parties to what conflict. And education can actually be perceived as highly political. What do you teach? And so it's a highly sensitive area and also in relation to women's access or girls access to education is also highly complex. So I think we can see that the more that systems are breaking down in countries and I, and I mentioned at the beginning just how long it is that conflicts are going on. This means that the systems, everything is breaking down and therefore it's vital and technology can play a role in terms of access because the proximity doesn't have to be physical to give education and that's what we've seen through technology. You can provide something by indirect proximity or digital proximity as we refer to it, but it can also be highly sensitive. So you have to really work out what are the needs um, ask people themselves what is it you're looking for and if it is English or it may be something else but what it, what is it that you need and I think I mentioned at the beginning information as aid but really help people to understand and understand what they need where they see the risks because they will know it far better than anybody else and then work out what is the best response that can be provided on the ground or as people displace and I think you know education we will see has moved so far up the needs hierarchy of needs just because of the massive breakdown in, in, in context and yeah. the fact that one out of two refugee out of refugee displaced out of the 60 million is under 18 just this yeah, that's huge. one out of two uh, let's open it up for questions please raise your hand you have some? we're gonna bring the microphone over to you hi can you hear me I can't hear myself, but can you hear me? Yeah. Um, so I just want to ask you, education, absolutely, and we all get that. But the, 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 the most difficult band of refugees to deal with in any country in terms of integration is the boys between, I know this is a women's conference, but the boys between 15 and 22. Could technology help them find jobs, even if it's casual labor, so that they don't have to hang around in groups and spook people and give the bad impression? How does that work in terms of finding jobs for these kids? Um, uh, yes, thank you. We, uh, Tech Fugees, we did a hackathon in Amman 
with the Queen Rania Foundation, and that's the exact question they asked. It's like, how do we keep the guys, the boys, in school uh, following the education because we're co clearly missing them? Um, and the answer was to gamify and make them just more... So it was a gamified app. It's a prototype. I'm not saying it works yet. But the idea of all these small innovators, small, uh, young innovators, was to gamify education first. And then the second thing was to think of education as employment. So the courses would be provided by local employers because that's the skills they're requiring from... So, so that, that's my answer from that hackathon we had in Amman. No, I mean, I, I think that, I mean, we don't deal with integration in countries, in host countries. I mean, where we deal with is really the situations of conflict that we, that we meet around the world. But absolutely, the group of, and I started by saying you cannot look at the impact of conflict or displacement on women and girls without understanding the impact on men and boys. Because the number of mothers that we meet who say they, in insecure environments, they keep their boy, the boys off the street because they're afraid of forced recruitment, they're afraid that they might be imprisoned so interestingly in, in in some of the contexts we work it's the girls that are maybe easier to access education because for the boys it's too much of a risk because they get picked up and they get recruited so anything that can where technology can try to bridge some of those gaps but again in insecure environments you may not have the access to the connectivity the Wi-Fi um, and we see even uh, in highly insecure environments that one of the first things people ask for is Wi-Fi connection so that they are able to do that and people saw that as a sort of frivolous demand what is that but it's actually because of the ability to then connect to be able to receive education to be able to connect and um, to family members and loved ones so I think any the, the, what we have to do is understand what people will need technology for and then look at the best response that can that technology can bridge the gap and I would say fundamentally technology is about people it isn't about the technology itself. And so it has to respond to a need. And what we see in, in other environments, in our own home countries, is that tech develops to, grab, to close a gap that, has, that people have identified in the way they want to lead their lives. And it happens exactly the same in insecure environments. And I think that the more we can do to understand what those needs are and the ways that we can bridge the gap through technology or direct proximity or aid is absolutely critical. I do want to take another question, but let me just um, add to that. Um, uh, you know, as part of my reporting in Germany, for example, there have been a number of online platforms that have sprung up that are basically job bases that refugees can access. Refugees can uh, basically send their CVs in and say, you know what, I came from Syria or, you know, I came from Yemen and these are the skills that I had. I used to be an engineer, I used to work at an oil facility, or, you know, I used to be a pharmacist or I just used to be a clerk. Here are my skills. And then employers can go onto those job boards and say, you're the person I need, let's, let's hook up. But we need more of, need more of that. And, and it really also works mainly in countries where there are plenty of jobs to go around, where they're not respect. Then to simply send a message back to countries of origin, do not come to Libya because it's, it's, not, a, it's not a good way out for you. Um, it's interesting you raise it up. Uh, our last meeting at Tech Fugees Friends was about this, led by refugees themselves who said, we need to organize a hackathon on how you create technology to inform back in the country so they don't come because we had to deal with it and it was not uh, joyful at all. Uh, and we want to avoid people and yeah. So the refugees themselves came with that question of how do we build that and how you can help us tech refugees. Um, it's interesting also because the we came at the end of this meetup and conversation that no technology will stop them, even if they know. And I know this from Kelly. They know they can stay in France. They want to go to the UK whatsoever. There's like something very ingrained. They want to get there because they've been told because of... And I think it goes back to our point of like, we are not dealing with something that is just now, the last two years, five years, ten years. We're on big trends. And it comes from like globalization it comes from colonization and when uh, Queen Victoria said you are all my fellow citizens and you can come anytime it's like those big they want to come to the UK they want to come to Europe and we haven't yet uh, fixed a time for this hackathon on how are we going to design information to go back in the country because 
frankly, we don't think it's information. We think the answer is somewhere else. I mean, for those of you who don't know the ICSC, part of our work is also to visit people in detention, and we visit more than a million people that are detained. And so we see uh, the reasons for their detention can also be because they've been on a migratory route and, and the conditions are, can be horrendous. And the treatment before they even arrive there is often horrendous. And it's true, people don't really know. Uh, and you can interview people now and they will say, they, they will get there, even if you tell them the horrors, they're still looking to go. I think one of, the, one of the important points that we see are the family associations of those who are missing back in the origin countries that they're coming through. Because also getting information back to them um, about how the, the because it can be for years that they haven't been able to find their, their family members but the problem again comes back to the systemic nature of this displacement that it is going on for so long that you know people feel they haven't any choice and they and so they you know if somebody's gone missing they may say somebody to find them so I think one of the the technology can bridge certain gaps by providing information but it's very difficult for people to access that and really understand that it applies to them uh, and so I'm not I think that part of sadly part of the solution is going to be in finding finding solutions and they're not humanitarian to political solutions to these ongoing crises because uh, humanitarian is perceived as the sort of, okay, that's the response that can be given, but in the absence of real political solutions, we will not be able to resolve many of these issues. And, you know, sadly, there isn't much international consensus around anything at the moment. And until that happens, we will just see this. This is not a short-term thing. This will go on for decades unless there is real political solutions to resolving these crises. Political and economical, huh? because this is a market here we're talking about. This is a market of mafia and smugglers. We know the numbers, 6 billion making money out of migrants in 2015 in Europe. 6 billion, right? The European Union could ask for that money from the refugees, migrants. No, it's the smugglers that get it. Um, and even if you crack down the, the smugglers route in Libya, what happens to the smugglers? They need to feed their families. So they're going to go to ISIS. So we really need to reinvent. You have to eat at the end of the day. So if the smuggling of people, migrants, are uh, not giving you the money, then ISIS will give you the money. Uh, so we really need to think really wisely about it. It's, it's really complex, and I have no answer. <laughs> well, maybe that no answer is, is uh, the best uh, way to leave it. But actually, let's just push our time just a little bit, and if we could get one last very quick question in. Thank you. Thank you very much, and, and I thought it was great that you were talking about this as a long-term issue that we have to face. So we talked a lot about what we're doing for migrants themselves and how we help them with education. Uh, what do you think technology can do to help people who are um, scared or maybe resistant in the face of migrants coming to their countries? Because I think we're facing a lot of fear and, and, and I would love to see what, what you're thinking about that. Great question. Um, okay, so last April, we did a fundraising dinner because we rely on private donations. Um, and uh, we bring always at those dinners those refugees. We don't tell anyone. We don't say like, ah, refugee. <laughs> Um, and when came uh, the dinner, the meal, I said, Noor is going to tell us a bit more about what we're eating tonight because it was what his mother would cook uh, at home in Aleppo. And then people were like, what? Oh, he's a refugee. First time I'm touching a refugee. Um, why I'm saying this is he took the... He took uh, the audience. He spoke. It's fine. It's a phone. It won't fall away. Um, and he said to everyone, you know, I was... Uh, I was an entrepreneur back in, uh, back in Syria and um, I was afraid of others. So I understand that some people can be afraid of others. Being xenophobic, uh, even if it's a bit extreme, can be something human nature. I'm afraid of the difference. I'm afraid of someone else. But he said, so we can't be asking people to really just embrace diversity and others uh, like this tomorrow, right? But he said, you have to be afraid of the populist, the one that control the fear of others and manipulate it for their own gain, right? Because these ones are taking advantage of others that fear. Now, why he was making this point? He was like, now, because I was an entrepreneur and I want to help other refugee entrepreneurs here in France, 
I want to build an incubator where all the people that are entrepreneurs are only refugees. And the one rule is that anyone you employ for your companies are voting FN, are anti-immigrants people, because then they'll get jobs and they'll not be afraid of the refugees anymore. So that was the solution, right? That's, that can maybe work. But to answer your question, uh, it's a super important question is, we can't help refugees if we can't help our people outside of the street homeless. It's, it's not responsible. We need, when we talk about te building technology for refugees, we think also in the mind, anyone who's left out in that society. And that means people in the suburbs or people in the streets, right? Um, so, but we think that refugees are at the extreme experience of humanity because they have to say, I am human for people to look at them and maybe treat them as human. So, so we think that helping them will help the whole, you know, value chain, I don't know you want to call it, like the whole spectrum. Um, and, and the second thing I want to say is, yes, we need to talk more on those panels when we talk about migration, about the people that are afraid of migrants because their situation has not advanced for the last 20 years. Their salary has been just at the same level and they don't see how it's going to progress for their lives. So how would they think that it's going to be better for those refugees that are coming? Why would they? There are good reasons to think that those refugees that have crossed the sea are survivors and they will be more resilient than the one that have stayed here for 20 years not getting a salary raise. Point. But it doesn't address the emotional layer of my situation hasn't changed. My state doesn't care. He cares more about refugees. So thank you for bringing up that question. Yeah, I, I mean, it's a great question. I would say, firstly, terminology matters. I mean, 20 years ago, 25 years ago, when I was working in the former Yugoslavia, we didn't talk about people as migrants, they're refugees. If you're living in Syria today, you're a displaced or a refugee, um, or if you're fleeing because of that. So I think terminology matters. I think we also have to recognize we're living in a time where people are very afraid. And the terminology is fueling that. People are afraid and they feel insecure, actually. And I think we... We can't, we can't take that for granted. We have to understand where people, what people's insecurity is, whether they are in a, in a country of origin of displacement or migration or in a country of hosting um, those who have been a refugee or, or um, a migrant. And I think we have to be able to understand that and we have to provide information which is correct and factually correct, which helps people to cut through the fear. I think I would just finish by saying when we see really... Um, shocking examples of how war is being waged. We see an enormous outpouring of empathy from people. And we do see that people care. They, they do not want to see a four-year-old child wash up on a beach somewhere. They care deeply, and it's how do you harness that, but also cut through that fear and insecurity that people have, which is often fueled by misinformation or not really understanding. And I think that I would just like to, to leave people with the notion, you know, to think about what would it take for you to leave your home and you know I think that it would take an awful lot the threshold is very high we don't take that decision lightly and I think we need to help people understand that for their own personal situation you know, what would it take for you to really leave your home I'll just one add thing a solution quick because I talked but um, so there are two solutions we have apps across different countries in Europe and one in France it's a platform where you can host a refugee and it has transformed the lives of everyone who's done it. Anyone who's offered their bed for two months for a refugee, their lives have been transformed for the stories they've heard. We have one in Norway. Stuff. You can have dinner with a refugee and they come and it changes your life. So to your point is once you meet a refugee, you understand that they're human like you and it just clicks. So if you know of a friend who doesn't really like the refugees, but you want to plug him to that, maybe. And uh, making an announcement, at the end of this month, uh, TechFugees is hosting a global summit at Station F. We're going to have all the people creating technology for the refugees in Europe, Middle East and Africa, discussing a bit those topics in more depth and with more solutions. Um, and we have approximately, as of today, I think 70 refugees that are all engineers registered of coming. And you'll see it for yourself, like those guys have skills. It's not the lack of talent we have, it's the lack of opening our hearts and being part of the solution. Well, thank you both so much for that discussion. It was, you know, obviously there are a lot of outstanding challenges that have yet to be resolved, but clearly from what you all are saying, there's also a lot of potential out there to find solutions. So 
Thanks to our audience for joining us. Please feel free to come up and ask these folks additional questions if you want, because I know there are many outstanding. Really appreciate, appreciate you being here.